we can take up the questions uh, uh, now bh gardi college one of the person who is living in canada he is trying to use the server which is available in us and using that server if he is making any crime in india then uh, any case can be filed or if it can be filed then against it can be filed okay so uh, your question is if somebody is hosting a fisher sitting in canada and he is uh, uh, hosting a website uh, on a server in the us and he is targeting a bank in india how do you how do you take action this is uh, more or less a classic case uh, you know the way it happens before we come to the legal aspect uh, you know the first thing is uh, fishers normally operate from outside uh, india the, the guy who puts up the website now when multiple countries are involved it becomes very difficult uh, for uh, even the bank to get the logs of those websites for example as you said if the phishing website is hosted in the us the first thing that the bank wants if i have to take any action is to say that this page was put at this time from this ip address which probably is the ip address of the phisher from where he connected from his home to the server in the us now all this getting all this very difficult so so if you want to take legal action is very difficult but it falls under the category of cyber crime in india so the bank if they want can take it up with the cyber crime cell who then will take it up with concerned authorities in our country as well as internationally to pursue the matter of course i'm not i am no legal expert i'm telling you this from my experience of working with banks it very difficult to pursue it legally techno india so my question is regarding the feeding the dummy data in the phishing website so what is the use of feeding the dummy data so if we fill, fill something wrong data or correct data what is the impact happening so if you are the phisher uh, what have you done you have set up the phishing site and whatever user id passwords that are getting collected you are taking it and you are using it to commit fraud you the phisher is making an assumption that most of these user id passwords will be correct now what i am doing as a bank is that i have detected the phishing website using automated scripts i will just keep pumping user id passwords which are fake but which follow the standard pattern which the bank accepts for example if the bank accepts only alphabets as a user id i will start pumping ids which are only alphabets and if the passwords have always been alpha numeric with eight characters i will always put alpha numeric 8 as the dummy id and password now the fisher instead of getting a collection of let's say 100 user ids and passwords which are probably the original ones he gets a 100000 99000 were pumped in by the bank and the 1000 were pumped in by the customers so now it becomes a little difficult for the user for the fisher to find out which of these 1000 out of the 100000 is the correct one it is just making it a little more difficult for the fisher to identify the correct user id password from a collection from a larger collection that's all we are doing so once we know that it is a phishing website right so why should we enter the details like credentials please differentiate uh, <coughs> one is the phishing website is up and the phishing customer is getting fooled if you are the customer of the bank you should not enter that is the first thing but as a bank i have no control the website is up and running and many of my customers are sure to give it away so as a bank i am trying to make it difficult for not my customers but for the fisher to identify the right one that is why i am feeding dummy data i the bank is feeding dummy data not the not the customer so can you tell us something about sim cloning also sim card sim card cloning with respect to one time password which we used to get over the mobile it's a good question because uh, yeah sim cloning uh, there have been a few incidents in the in, even in the last 12 months uh, uh, in bombay targeting couple of banks where uh, sim cloning happened uh, of course the objective of the of cloning the sim was to receive the uh, one time password sms that the bank is sending out whether it is for logging or for doing a transaction what the attacker did in this case where uh, you know in a specific incident i think which was targeting icici the driver of an elderly person the elderly person was traveling outside india uh, you know uh, to the us for long time so what he did he had the copy of the uh, he had the copy of uh, the the driver's you know the address proof and the license etc so he submitted it to one of the mobile providers i think it was vodafone or airtel and told that the sim card has been lost i would like to have a, a duplicate and the airtel or the vodafone itself issued a new sim card so so it was it was like i mean not really i mean you can call it cloning from the impact but the original mobile provider only gave the uh, gave the duplicate of the sim card and the guy did the transaction the one time password came on the mobile and it was completed yeah 
సార్ ఇట్స్ విత్ రిగార్డ్ టు కెనరా బ్యాంక్ సర్వీసెస్ సార్ వన్స్ ఏ సంబడి ఎల్స్ స్టోలన్ మై యూజర్ ఐడి కెనరా బ్యాంక్ యూజర్ ఐడి అండ్ దే హ్యావ్ ట్రైడ్ త్రీ టైమ్స్ సో ఫోర్త్ టైమ్ ఇట్ గెట్స్ బ్లాక్డ్ ఆటోమేటికలీ సో దో ఐ హామ్ ద రైట్ పర్సన్ టు డూ ద ట్రాన్సాక్షన్ మై అకౌంట్ వాస్ బ్లాక్డ్ so how do we overcome this particular problem sir yeah these uh, yeah somebody uh, trying to uh, randomly guess your password was done before phishing attack started the phisher normally gets the right password so he will not have to try more than one time he will get it right the first time only so happened uh, it uh, th- th- three or four times it so happened sir. Yeah, so sir. the account is getting blocked by the canara bank yeah so uh, sir if you look at it, the way canara bank is thinking is that uh, you know this specific question is not directly related to phishing uh, the way canara bank is thinking is uh, security is more than uh, security is more important than user convenience now normally when we are typing in a password we might make one or two errors so if you see most of the banks today they don't lock out your password uh, even if you try it some 8 9 times Let, let us not take the case of uh, canara bank let us let just take the case of the gmail login if you enter your password three times wrongly they don't lock you out the fourth time they will put up an image which we technically call a captcha they will tell you you try once more but enter the image whatever is i displayed in the image this is basically done to ensure that nobody can run an automated program and guess your password by trying 100000 attempts so canara bank has done this as a good measure to reduce the chances of somebody guessing your password but that is at a cost of your convenience now if the if i sitting at my home can lock out your account in canara bank as long as i know your id but canara bank has done it for your own good it is better security so you will tell the bank that i didn't do it and of course whoever tried it was not able to crack your password and to steal any money so as i said it is a balance between convenience and security it's not really a complaint i mean and it, and it is not really something bad which canara bank has done they have just put their customer security ahead of the customer's convenience hello sir i have a question related to virtual keyboard uh, actually when the user entering user id and password to virtual keyboard that time other computer program may record the mouse tracking information and may send a video to the hacker is it possible yes it is technically possible so that is why i mentioned in one of the things uh, that in addition to key loggers uh, they have also started using screen grabber software which will uh, track the mouse movements on the virtual keyboard so it is effectively like having a key logger so those kind of malwares are also available nowadays i want to know that uh, if suppose i am accessing net banking in parallel i'm accessing some another website and those containing malicious code and uh, stealing session ids and cookies so is there any possibility by getting session ids and cookie cookies attackers uh, impersonate my account details yeah okay it's a uh, so if you are if you are accessing net banking uh, from uh, one browser window on the same browser you are uh, accessing some uh, some malware uh, sites yeah several attacks are possible yeah but uh, in general in general you need to remember that uh, Uh, your session id and your cookies are bound to the original site the browser uh, has controls only to submit the session id of onlinesba.com only to onlinesba.com there are several attacks like cross site scripting uh, uh, csrf etc where the scenario you mentioned can be exploited but directly no there is there is no harm you can be perfectly on a hacker website and access your online sbi but need to remember that even if there is no hacker website there is enough danger so why put your net banking account in even more danger by trying this that's the only thing good morning sir yes i want to discuss a real time problem faced by us due to more securities on a website like online sbi when we do a online trans- transaction it ask for otp sent to our mobile number but most of the time we didn't receive message on time and the sessions ends on the website yeah as What i said that, i mean that's a good uh, question as i said that's the balance that the bank has to strike between security and user convenience so uh, i am a user of sbi a very uh, you know a user of sbi for paying a lot of bills and irctc booking i have never had a problem but of course i am living in mumbai 
So I'm not very sure which, which location you are and there could be some locations where the, uh, sometimes SBA may not be at fault, but maybe your mobile service provider uh, who's probably not able to reach it to you. So, uh, so I'm saying it's a balance. It's a balance. Uh, 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 that is why probably SBA has not put SMS for the login, whereas many other banks have done it. So at least you can see and uh, see your account balance and do a transaction uh, to already registered beneficiaries. It is, it is just that uh, uh, the third party transactions have, have been secured using SMS OTP. So it's definitely an infrastructure related problem, not a question, not, not a problem related to security. But as I said, SBI or any bank takes these calls uh, of how much secure they should be looking at the profile of their net banking customers. If, if SBA has a lot of net banking customers coming from remote locations where internet is fine, but mobile is not so widespread, SBA would probably take a decision not to have this. Uh, you know, so, so of course I cannot speak on behalf of SBI. I'm just saying this is what SBA must be thinking. Dronachari College. Sir, I want to ask two questions to you. First question is, as per your experience, which bank has the best and secured login policy. You want to avoid, you can avoid this question. Second part of this question is basically, is there any guideline from RBI to have similar kind of uh, login policy, like uh, asking the users to change their password at a certain interval? And second point on this, thing or verifying the IP address of the machine from where you are trying to log into the bank site. This is my first question. There's no RBI policy which says that uh, a second factor of uh, authentication has to be there for the login. Uh, it is not there. So banks are, uh, the banks uh, can choose to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, security measures as it is, as the bank thinks relevant, uh, which is also uh, related to the profile of the bank's customers. What I mean to say is there are several banks who have issued hardware tokens only to their corporate net banking customers, but not to their retail net banking customers, because the uh, because the amounts uh, which are getting transacted are much higher. So, so it's not not just about the what uh, what the bank does. A bank, even SBI, may have a different login uh, security for retail customers vis-a-vis -vis corporate customers. Uh, which bank has the best login security? As I said, yeah, it is just my opinion. It's it's, it's not based on any security standards. I feel. Uh, banks which have put SMS as part of the login procedure and not just part of transactions are a little more secure than, uh, than the others. That is what I feel. And uh, is there a way to find out the IP address from where the user has logged in? Uh, yes, of course, there is a way and it is, uh, I mean, the, the IP address of the user uh, who logged in is visible in the, uh, in the logs of the net banking server. But if your question is more directed towards in that case, can I find out the IP of the fisher from where he did a fraudulent transaction? That may not be that easy because this is at the end of the day, this is a, this is an HTTP, a web based transaction. So the attacker sitting in uh, Bombay can access online SBI website through a proxy server, probably sitting in Nigeria or in the US. So what the IP address that will come on online SBI's uh, logs of the fisher or the attacker will not be his Bombay home IP, but that of the proxy server in uh, Nigeria or the US. So IP address will come, whether the fisher's IP will get revealed depends on how smart the fisher is. My second question is, is there any tool or portal or website from where we can find out the uh, registered domain owners, their details, etc.? Sorry, is, is your question, uh, how do I find the registered domains of a specific bank? No, it's in general. It could be of any of the domain name registered on the registry. For example, we are using whois.com to find out the details. Is there any uh, better tool than this from where we can find out the registered owner details, the yeah, contact details, even address, even the house address? No, there are different, uh, I mean, yeah, Google is so advanced today that if you just give a Google search for who owns the domain, you will get it. There used to be similar sites called allyouwhois.com and uh, many others which used to provide this. Since this searching, since this information has become useful for many banks, this has become a paid service by many providers. Mark Monitor is one of the providers which does that. 
So they, if you pay, pay them, they will give you, uh, you know, all kinds of information, not just when you ask, but as a bank, if you register for their service, they will proactively inform you if any domain gets registered with the, with the name SBI in it. But that has more become a paid service today. The basic information you can get just by Googling. Uh, top of the mind, I cannot remember any other websites other than who is, which provides this. Professor Ramage Institute. If, if at all I am, uh, say, I have entered my uh, user ID and password, what immediate corrective measure should I take? And the second one is, why can't email service provider stop phishing messages? Okay, the, the first question uh, is, uh, yeah, is an excellent uh, question. So as a user, the first thing you can do is to call up the bank and tell the bank that I have, that I have lost my user ID and password and my account has to be immediately disabled. That's the first thing that you can, you can do. Some banks have put up this facility called the dead man switch, wherein you yourself can log in and click on disable the account. So that you, from that moment onwards, yourself including nobody can log into that account unless the bank gives you a new password and issues a new password and you start using it again. So the first thing is call up the bank and inform them that uh, uh, you have lost your password and you want account disabled. If your bank gives you to auto disable it yourself, log in and disable it uh, immediately. That's the first thing. Email service providers, uh, it's very difficult to identify a phishing mail because uh, phisher is a very targeted attack. So ISPs and even the large mail providers like Google have probably perfected the detection and blocking of spam mails. But mostly phishing mails may not come under the category of spam. Phishers are really smart. They don't put unnecessary images, nothing. They just tell you this is a link and uh, you know, they just, they just try. Many of the phishing mails will, will not fall in the radar of a spam mail. That is why it is becoming more difficult for mail providers uh, to, uh, to, uh, to stop it. Uh, sir, good morning. What are the possible ways to get OTP password from the Fisher's point of view? Okay, what are the ways to get the uh, OTP from a Fisher's uh, point of view? Yeah. One of course is uh, what uh, one of our participants said, uh, SIM cloning. It's not very, it's not easy. It cannot be done white, uh, you know, in a widespread manner. The method by which uh, fishers are getting it now is is through voice phishing, which is which is which we call as you know phishing. So the fisher, uh, what he will normally do in the fish in the login page, he will ask you to give the user ID, password, and the mobile number. So you will give the mobile number, and he knows the bank is going to send the SMS to that mobile number. So he will call you, or he will SMS you from his number, saying that I am SMSing you from the bank's number. As part of testing, we have sent you a test SMS, kindly forward it back to this number. So he can get that. So, so either through cloning or through wishing attack, the attacker, uh, the fisher can uh, lure you to uh, share the uh, OTP uh, with him. Sir, I have one other question, sir. As we know, the, our user IP and password is stored on the bank server. So, it's secure. Okay, so uh, so that's right. That, that's a, that's a good question. It uh, puts some things in perspective. Your online SBI password is stored in two places. One is on online SBI server, and other is in your mind. So it is very difficult to break in into the data center and get a copy from there. That is why he's breaking it in, into you. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Dinesh Hindey from Vidya Pratishtan Baramati. Uh, sir, my question is: uh, What is the effectiveness of web web uh, beacon method? Because the fisher who can easily download the source code can easily change the JavaScript also. Yes, so, so it again is a, is a matter of efficiency for the fisher. How easily and quickly can you replicate the website? Now, if you look at uh, some websites uh, today, even if you look at online SBA and uh, you know, some of the other websites, the, the login page is fairly complicated. It's not very simple in many cases. They've got virtual keyboards. They've got links to their, to their other services. Uh, they've got multiple options. You want to log into the, to the website completely or you want to log in to the, directly to the transaction page. So, so the fisher doesn't want to really waste time understanding how SBA or why SBA has structured the page like this. The simplest would be to copy paste. But as you said, is, uh, if the fisher is, uh, is alert, he will probably examine the code. But, but at the same time, if the bank is also very, uh, you know, uh, this piece of code has to be hidden somewhere. Some places the bank will keep it in a very obvious place. There are many banks who keep this code 
within their virtual keyboard layout logic which is which itself is complicated so what the attacker will do attacker will see that okay this virtual keyboard logic the way the you know the virtual keyboard of citibank looks very different from sbi for different reasons so what i'm saying is if you put the javascript inside the virtual keyboard code maybe the uh, attacker will decide that i don't want to tamper otherwise the virtual keyboard color will look different or the shift key will look on the left hand side whereas it right. so you will not tamper with it so uh, even though the attacker can detect a bank person who is smart also will have ways to hide it you know really well but having said that from my experience i can tell you that uh, many of the phishing websites don't look very similar to the original even then users end up giving their passwords quite freely valchan uh, so nowadays mobile apps are uh, provided for mobile banking so if fisher can generate their own app uh, to get the passwords how to uh, differentiate the original app and the fiction app thank you sir it's a very good question uh, in fact a new service and an offering is coming up or the banks are very very much aware of this threat in fact right now if you go to the google play store and search for some of the prominent banks you will already see fake mobile applications it's a reality today but at at this point of time as we speak we have examined many of those uh, mobile applications belonging to our customers they are not really interested in phishing they are probably just trying to offer some service but if you are uh, if you are not a alert user you might end up putting the wrong mobile application for your bank so it's a, it's a, it's a real threat just like a fake website a fake mobile application on the i store or on the play store is a real threat the banks are trying to there's nothing the bank can do there's nothing the bank can do only thing you can do detect and disable as fast as you can and inform your users that this is the authentic one it's a difficult game but but that's what that's what we're doing and many banks yeah so so there are several measures which will come up for protection i'm not i'm not aware of uh, what the bank has done but what you said as a threat exists even today and it is real is incognito tab in a browser safer than an ordinary tab in a browser yeah from the from the point of view of phishing no from the point of phishing no incognito normally is a mode that is given for you if you are accessing a website uh, from a public computer and you want to ensure that you leave no traces incognito is is good and probably better than the normal but it is by no means a defense for phishing good morning sir my sir sandeep tit umbra college my question is which log should we analyze when we are under the phishing attack so that is what we uh, discussed in one of our slides uh, earlier uh, one of the logs that is most useful for you to analyze when you are under a phishing attack is the web server logs or sometimes we call the w3c logs uh, of the web server i mean your uh, net banking site will be hosted in an apache or a tomcat or a microsoft iis you need to examine the logs of that the logs can help you to detect if a phishing attack is in progress if as i said earlier if the phisher is redirecting the customer the bank's customer after the phish has happened if he is redirecting it to the original site that url will come in the referrer field also going forward you know sometimes the net banking application passwords are also required to be analyzed uh, the the logs of that because that will tell you from which ip address a transaction happened sometimes a bank uses this to validate that normally a user ramesh normally comes from his home and you know uh, uh, this source ip and now a fraud has happened it came from another ip so possibly it is a different uh, attacker so the web server and the application logs of your net banking is what is relevant and useful uh, sir my question is that in a response stage how we can apply the it act being as a common person being as a common person how we can apply the it act because we have a limited area limited scope we can block the ip we can uh, feed some data as a phishing site but how can we apply the it act yeah this is again related to the legal aspect which uh, which another participant has asked i am by no means a legal expert but the immediate the immediate priority of the bank is to is to bring the site down and not to take legal action uh, so so that is why the bank uh, of course you know uh, many banks do not pursue legal action because if you look at the number of phishing sites that are targeting a uh, uh, you know top bank in india like an sbi or icici it will run into hundreds per month so it may not be feasible even if the bank wants to pursue legal action against each and every 
uh, fisher who put up a website which was alive for maybe 4 hours after which it went down and a new fishing site has started. So as you said yeah there will be certain uh, laws and the IT act which may be applicable but, but the banks uh, primary goal will be to minimize the lifetime of a fishing site and to put measures which will ensure that even if hundreds of sites come a uh, transaction fraud cannot happen. Those are the two priorities for the bank. Yes, Namachari Institute. Uh, this is Vineet from uh, Namachari Institute of Technology and Science, Rajam Pet. Yes. And uh, sir, I want to put two questions from you. One is regarding key loggers. Go ahead. Like, how can we trace that key loggers are installed in our system? And the second question is regarding fake mailers. Like uh, um, using fake mailers, we can get the mail from uh, with the domain name of the bank, like customer dot care at the rate sbi dot co dot in. So, how will we differentiate whether this mail is from the legitimate user or it's a fake mail? Okay. So, first question: key loggers. Yeah, there is no specific tool. The only thing, if you are asking me from a point of view of a, uh, you know a home user who does net banking the, the best defense is to have an antivirus software a good leading antivirus software a paid software most of the uh, good antiviruses uh, like a Kaspersky or a Symantec will detect key loggers today unless they are very very sophisticated. Uh, is it possible to differentiate uh, that the mail has come from a fake contact us at online sba.com from the original contact us at online SBI it is not possible unless the bank put some measures like digital signing of the message where you are using certificates to authenticate it there is no way that uh, we can uh, we can differentiate. So, digital certificates and all it is not that the bank is not aware of it, but it will make it much more inconvenient for you. So, that is why when uh, when an SBI sends a mail from contact us probably SBI will put some details about you your name Ramesh and your account number. So, that the uh, so that you are able to know that yes it has come from my bank not by looking at the from address, but from the contents of the mail that is a more easier mechanism. Technically a from address can be spoofed and the original owner of the from address can do nothing about it. So, for one I have two questions basically. First question is for safe internet banking can you suggest me which one is the better browsing site that is Mozilla, Internet Explorer or Chrome. This is the first question and the second one is on some net banking sites even when Java is enabled, but the message comes as Java runtime error. When we close that, site is running normally. So, can you suggest to me what is this? Thank you. Okay, so for, I mean, uh, uh, which brand of browser, which version is uh, better, uh, more secure, is a is a very wide question. Uh, of course, each browser has their own uh, uh, advantages. The only thing you need to keep in mind is the banks normally test most of their new functionalities and uh, the testing happens not security testing functionality testing happens on IE because IE is the most popular browser. So, so and as far as phishing is concerned which brand of browser you use is is going to make very less uh, difference to whether you get fished or not it is not at all depend on the brand of the browser. So, regarding that specific Java question maybe uh, maybe I am not the best person to probably answer that. So, the question we have two questions first question can we escape a keylogger attack if backspace buttons are frequently used while we type a password and the second question. So the second question is normally um, when we are downloading the free softwares malwares are always also attached with it. So, how can we uh, trust the free softwares? Okay, the first question is uh, yeah can we avoid uh, key loggers by pressing backspace uh, in between ok. Uh, yeah, it depends on who is more smarter you or the person who wrote the key logger. So, uh, so I would not I would not recommend that you uh, do net banking login from a machine uh, where, where you suspect some malware. So, I do not think we should trust our uh, own methods of backspace and all that uh, for that it is better to use a virtual keyboard if you are on a public computer especially on a cyber cafe it is best advised that you use uh, uh, you know uh, the virtual keyboard facility which most banks are giving today. And uh, uh, can you trust the free software? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean that's uh, that's not a question for me, I guess. Yeah, in general, I what I would say is have a proper antivirus, uh, whether you use free software or not. Actually, this is about uh, finding simple and effective way to educate user. In your slide, you have specified uh, some simple way to effective way for users. 
normally all the websites have the login form like uh, uh, username and password the username is actually we used to type as a mail id so norm, uh, all the users uh, first will really give their um, mail id as password so what kind of awareness should be taken by the website to avoid this yeah normally uh, of course uh, if we are talking about net banking login uh, the net banking uh, the, the bank already takes uh, some of the measures like your login id cannot be your password or your the entire login id cannot be part of your password etc so that to some extent is ensured by most of the banks and as one of the one of the participants mentioned some banks have even gone to the extent of saying that uh, if you try wrong password three times you know you get logged out or uh, you know you have to change your password once in uh, once in 45 days or 90 days some of the banks like uh, you know uh, have implemented those things so uh, as you said there is a tendency that you know not just in email sites but also in banking passwords that we try to choose a password which is very easy for us to remember which may be very related to the id itself but the trick is you have to choose a password which is easy for you to remember but difficult for somebody to guess that is the trick so it's not that it has to be very difficult for you only to remember it can be something that is very personal for you which you may find it easy to remember but a fisher can never guess that is a smart way of uh, choosing a password not only for net banking for any of the online services that you use okay thank you very much